My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Ribbon. What happens when the narcissist becomes a father or a mother to a disabled child, a challenged child intellectually or otherwise, or a sick child, chronically ill, weak, and frail? The narcissist regards his disabled or challenged child as an insult, a direct challenge to his self-perceived perfection and omnipotence, a constant nagging reminder and source of negative narcissistic supply, and the reification and embodiment of a malevolent and hostile world which tirelessly conspires to render the narcissist the victim through misfortune and catastrophe. The precarious foundations of the narcissist's false self, and therefore his ability to function, are undermined by this miscegenation. Relentlessly challenged by his defective offspring's very existence, and by the persistence of its attendant painful reminders, the narcissist lashes out acts out, seeking to persecute and penalize the sources of his excruciating frustration, the child and his mother. The narcissist holds the mother responsible for this failure, not himself. She brought this shame and perturbation into his otherwise fantastic and orderly life. It was she who gave issue to this new fount of torment, this permanent reminder of fallibility, imperfection, mortality, impotence, guilt, disgrace, and fear. To rectify this wrong, to restore the interrupted balance, and to firmly regain an assured, uh, an assured sense of grandiosity, the narcissist resorts to devaluation. He humiliates belittles and demeans both the unfortunate child and his suffering mother. The narcissist compares their failings unfavorably to his, to his own wholeness. He berates and mocks the child and his mother for their combined disability, frailty, weakness, meekness, and resourcelessness. He transforms them into the captive butts of his unbridled sadism and the cowed adherence of a cult-like shared psychosis. Serves them well for having thus ruined his life, figures the narcissist. Casting himself outwardly as a compassionate proponent of tough love, the narcissist eggs his charges on mercilessly. He contrasts the slowness with his self-imputed alacrity, their limitations with his infinite grasp, their mediocrity with his genius and acuity, their defeats with his triumphant life, real or imagined. He harps on and leverages their insecurities, and he displays his hateful contempt for this mother-child diet with a, f with a fiery vengeance whenever he is confronted, criticized, or resisted. The narcissist may even turn violent in order to enforce the discipline of his distorted worldview and delusional exigencies of reality. By reducing the child, by confronting the mother, the narcissist feels elevated yet again. Bonding and attachment in infancy are critical determinants and predictors of well-being in adulthood. A small minority of children are born, indeed, with dysfunctions, such as attention, hyperactivity, deficit disorder, or Asperger's disorder, or some other kind of autism. These dysfunctions prevent the children from properly bonding with or attaching to a primary caregiver, mother in most cases. Environmental factors such as an unstable home, 
parental absenteeism or a disintegrating family unit also play a role and can lead to the emergence of reactive attachment disorder, RAD. Toddlers adapt to this sterile and hostile emotional landscape by regressing to an earlier phase of unbridled, self-sufficient and solipsistic primary narcissism. Disabled and challenged children of narcissistic parents may well end up being narcissists themselves, a sad but inescapable irony. Narcissistic parents of seriously ill children derive narcissistic supply from onlookers, friends, family, colleagues and community, and they do that by attracting attention to their role as saintly caretakers, selfless and sacrificial. They are demonstra demonstratively and ostentatiously patient, compassionate, suffering heroically and dedicated to the child, its welfare and ultimate healing. They flaunt the child's sickness as a kind of a hard worn but well-deserved medal, down in the trenches with their tortured offspring, doing desperate battle with a pitiless enemy, the disease. It is an intoxicating part in the unfolding film that is the narcissist life. But this irresistible craving for attention should be demarcated from the sinister affliction colloquially known as Münchhausen by proxy syndrome. Patients afflicted with a factitious disorder, colloquially known as Münchhausen syndrome, seek to attract the attention of medical personnel by feigning or by self-inflicting serious illness or injury. Münchhausen by proxy syndrome factitious illness or disorder by pro proxy or imposed by another, or fabricated or induced illness by carer, there are many names. Well, this disorder involves the patient inducing illness in or causing injury to a dependent, a child, an old parent. And they do this in order to gain, in their capacity as caretakers, the attention, praise and sympathy of medical care providers. Both syndromes, Minhausen and Minhausen by proxy, are forms of shared psychosis, folie à deux or folie à plusieurs, forms of crazy making with hospital staff as unwilling and unwitting participants in the drama. Superficially, this overwhelming need for consideration by figures of authority and role models, like doctors, nurses, clergy, social workers. This resembles the narcissist's relentless and compulsive pursuit of narcissistic supply, which also consists of attention, adulation, admiration, being feared, noted, etc. But despite the superficial similarities, there are some important differences. To start with, the narcissist, especially the somatic variety, worships his body and cherishes his health. If anything, narcissists tend to be hypochondriacs. They are loath to self-harm and self-mutilate, let alone fake laboratory tests and consume potentially deleterious, deleterious substances and medications. They are also unlikely to seriously damage their sources of supply, for instance their children, as long as they are combined, of course, and adulated. As opposed to narcissists, People with both Midhausen syndromes desire acceptance. They seek love, caring, relationships and nurturing, not merely attention. The landscape of the Midhausen disorder and Midhausen by proxy disorder patients is emotional. And they, they have emotional needs that amount to more than the mere regulation of their sense of self-worth. In other words, they look for more than attention, while narcissists are looking only for attention. People with Winhausen have no full-fledged false self, unlike the narcissist. There's only a clinging, insecure, traumatized, deceitful and needy true self. Winhausen syndrome may be comorbid, can be diagnosed with personality disorders, though um, in both cases, the patients are pathological liars, 
schizoid, paranoid, hypervigilant, and aggressive, there are still massive differences between people who are diagnosed only with personality disorders and those who are comorbid with mean concept. While narcissists are indiscriminate and promiscuous when it comes to their sources of narcissistic supply, anyone would do. Patients with Minhausen syndromes derive emotional nurturance and sustenance mainly from healthcare practitioners. So we, so we should not confuse the two mental health categories. Still, in all these cases, the child is a prop in the adult's theater of life. He is a pivot. He is to be used, abused, and when, when he comes to his own, when it becomes autonomous, when it becomes critical, discarded.